In today's episode, we go over some of the most insane shark attacks told on the channel so far. From a diver getting his head bitten off by a great white shark, to a surfer who was attacked by two great white sharks at the exact same time. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are the most insane shark attacks you'll ever hear. Welcome to Vinyl Affliction. It was Saturday, April 10th, 1968. Stephen Samples and his father Milton headed down to the beach on Singer Island, Florida. The water was warm and calm. There were lots of families enjoying the seaside. Children were splashing about in the water or building sand castles on the beach. A group of teenagers stood a short distance away from the bathers. They were baiting long lines with freshly caught fish and casting them out to sea. They then jumped into a small boat and motored out into the water, pouring a bucket of animal blood out behind them. Unbeknown to the nearby swimmers, this trail of blood lured sharks to the area. The teenager's aim was to then fish for the sharks for the rest of the day. As the sharks were enticed to the area, Stephen and his father Milton stepped into the sea. Stephen was keen to try out his snorkeling gear. He carried his fins down to the water's edge. As the sea gently lapped at his feet, he pulled the fins onto his feet. His father carried an inflatable air mattress under one arm and helped his son into the sea with the other. Whilst Stephen pushed off from the beach and splashed about with his face beneath the surface, his dad lay on the air mattress. Less than three feet from the shore was a steep drop-off where the shallows gave way to deeper water. After half an hour or so, Milton called to his son that he was getting out. Stephen lifted his head, acknowledged his dad, and continued to look underwater. As he floated there, he could see the sandy bottom of the sea five or six feet below him. An occasional fish swam past. He bobbed up and down, occasionally diving to pick up shells from the seafloor. The water was slightly murky, but the sunlight still penetrated the shallow seas. Stephen lifted his head above the water to check how close he was to the shore. As he did so, he noticed something out of the corner of his eye. He looked and saw a large fin coming towards him. In a panic, he turned and began swimming to the shore as quickly as he could. He frantically kicked his legs, his fins propelling him through the water at speed. He pulled with his arms, splashing the surface. Then he felt something that terrified him. He felt a sudden and powerful tug on his leg. He screamed out for his father, Dad! Shark! His father heard Stephen's cries. He turned back to the water just in time to see his ten-year-old son being dragged underwater. He dropped the inflatable mattress and sprinted into the sea. Stephen was only about twenty-five feet from the shore. Milton dived in, powering through the water towards the commotion. He saw a shark's fin come for him, too. He ducked underwater and braced himself. As he saw the dark figure emerge from the murkiness, he waved his arms around in front of him. It seemed to work. The shark veered away at the last second. Milton popped back up and saw his son resurface, coughing and spluttering. Stephen felt a tremendous pain in his back as he was bitten again. The shark thrashed about, tossing Stephen from side to side in the water. He fought back. He whacked the shark on the nose desperately trying to grab it and force it away from him, but the force of the shark was too strong. As Stephen's father swam towards him, he noticed another fin, and then another. There was more than one shark. They were in a feeding frenzy. Stephen cried out again. Blood spilled into the water, surrounding him in a dark cloud. The commotion had alerted people on the beach. Other swimmers ran from the water in a panic. A large crowd stood at the edge of the sea as Milton shouted for Stephen to swim towards him. Stephen tried desperately to make his way toward his dad, but he felt another crunch as a shark bit his backside, clamping down with its powerful jaws around his buttocks. Thomas Fletcher, a member of the public who was about sixty feet away, heard the screams and saw the commotion in the water. He grabbed a nearby surfboard and immediately started paddling towards the young boy. He initially thought Stephen was half sat on an inflatable boat, but then he realized the gray object next to the boy 
was actually the back of a shark as it arched out of the water right next to Stephen. Although the attack only lasted a few minutes, it felt like a lifetime for all those involved. Stephen was fighting to keep above the water. He was losing blood, and the sharks were coming back for more. When Thomas reached Stephen and his dad, he tried to grab Stephen onto the surfboard, but the boy's hands were slippery. Stephen's left arm was bleeding profusely. Bright red blood spilled down his outstretched arm and spurted into the surrounding water. Thomas managed to haul the ten-year-old onto the surfboard and paddled towards the shore. He clamped his hand around Stephen's open wound, trying to stem the bleeding. Milton helped to push the surfboard to the beach and toward the waiting crowd. Retired Navy officer Robert McClintock spotted the scene unfolding from 200 feet away. He ran to the shallows as Stephen was being pushed back to safety on the surfboard. He immediately applied pressure to Stephen's wounds and took charge of the situation. They laid the boy on the beach, wrapping clothing and towels around his gaping wounds and tying them as tightly as they could. A can of ice-cold beer was applied to Stephen's forehead and warm blankets placed over his body. The ambulance had been called and was on its way. When Robert had wrapped all of Stephen's injuries, he and some others lifted the boy onto an inflatable bed and carried him to the approaching ambulance. Stephen was rushed to hospital and was receiving treatment from surgeons within 20 minutes of the attack. Speed was key to saving Stephen's life. The quick thinking of those who witnessed the attack ensured he was pulled from the water and treated as quickly as possible. Stephen said that the attack was painful. He was bitten at least four times. The shark's teeth had sliced into his arm, leg, buttocks, and back. He described feeling a crunch as the shark bit him. But as adrenaline surged through his body, the youngster was able to withstand the pain. He spent a week in St. Mary's Hospital, West Palm Beach. His open wounds were stitched closed. Witnesses who remained on the beach after the attack saw several sharks splashing in the blood trail that Stephen had left behind. His surgeons pulled teeth fragments from his bite marks, which were identified as belonging to a silky shark. These sharks were common in the area. Eyewitnesses also identified the species of shark splashing about in the shallows as looking like a silky. Although there had definitely been more than one shark circling Stephen, it is thought that only one was responsible for the attack, although some claim to have witnessed multiple sharks biting Stephen. The shark responsible for the bites was estimated to be about nine feet long, judging by eyewitness accounts and the size of the fin and body protruding through the surface of the water. The shark had caused significant damage to Stephen and left him with limited mobility in his left arm and hand. He was lucky to be alive. An inquiry was opened into the actions of the teenage anglers. Their careless behavior, baiting the water with the deliberate intention of attracting sharks within close proximity to a swimming beach, was under scrutiny. The property owners and local communities were also accused of negligence. This is because they had not warned swimmers of the dangers or provided adequate protection such as nets, fences, or shark deterrence in the area. It is not known what the outcome of these legal challenges were. It is incredible that Stephen survived his shark attack. Although he has life-changing injuries, the quick action of those around him and the ability to get to a hospital within minutes all helped to ensure his survival. No one can blame the shark for its attack. It had been attracted to the area and was searching for prey near the beach. The murky water may have also contributed to its misidentification of Stephen, leading the Silky to attack. Thankfully, he was surrounded by the right people to help him in an emergency, and he lived on to remember the day he almost met his unfortunate final affliction. The Chilean abalone, popularly known as locos, is a species of large edible sea snail native to the Pacific coastlines of Chile and Peru. Locos are renowned for their delectable flavor and tender meat, making them a prized culinary delicacy. Fishermen relish the opportunity to gather locos, mainly to supply local markets and restaurants with these savory delights. 
They venture into the vast Pacific and explore its rocky shores, tide pools, and submerged crevices in search of these prized gastropods. However, not all fishermen emerge victorious, as occasionally formidable predators from deep beneath turn the ocean into a deadly battleground while patrolling their watery domain. It was January the 5th, 1980, a serene and overcast Saturday morning when Jose Lorenes Miranda embarked on his fishing expedition in the southern Pacific Ocean at Punta Negra. Clad in a sleek black neoprene wetsuit, he resembled a mysterious figure blending seamlessly with the maritime environment. As he and his crew stepped onto a sturdy seven-meter wooden boat, it creaked softly under their weight, echoing the anticipation in the air. With a sense of purpose, they steered the boat further into the sea and ventured away from the familiar coastline. A few meters from shore, they anchored the boat and got to work. With unwavering focus, Jose tightened the grip on his inline accumulator tank and tools. In his left hand, he carried a sturdy collecting bag, its open jaws eagerly awaiting the bountiful marine wonders that he would discover. In his right hand, a trusty pry bar dangled from his grip, poised to assist in the careful extraction of the elusive locos hidden beneath the rocks. Standing on the edge of the boat, Jose inhaled deeply and, with a leap, broke the surface tension and plunged into the embrace of the aquatic realm. Underwater, a new world unfurled. He navigated through shimmering curtains of sunlight, revealing a symphony of colors beneath the depths. Schools of fish darted gracefully, their scales glistening like precious gems. With each stroke, he moved deeper, exploring rocky crevices and sandy beds. For the next 35 minutes, Jose went on collecting locos, occasionally utilizing the pry bar to spear curious fish that swam too close. However, as Jose surveyed his spoils, a flicker of dissatisfaction crossed his face. Though his new catch was impressive, it did not yet match the image of abundance he held in his mind. A relentless thirst for more gnawed at his determination, driving him to seek greater fulfillment. Resurfacing in disappointment, he climbed back aboard the boat and together with the crew set sail once more, guided by an unwavering belief that there was yet another haven just beyond the horizon where an extraordinary catch awaited them. Guided by instinct and experience, the crew found a new hunting ground which was 20 meters from shore. They anchored the boat in the midst of an underwater oasis, which unfortunately was also within 150 meters of a sea lion hollowed. His crew and fellow fishermen, whose boats peppered across the seascape, observed with curiosity as Jose donned his gear and prepared to dive into the unknown. After swimming five meters from the vessel, he angled his body obliquely and began his descent to the deep. However, a minute into his voyage to the seafloor, Jose's peaceful dive was shattered by a sudden surge of violence. Jose turned to his left, only to be met by the open mouth of an ancient predator whose sleek form had silently sliced through the calm water, a massive great white shark. He instinctively raised his left hand to shield himself from the onslaught of the relentless shark who clearly wanted to eat him. But fate had cruel intentions, and the shark's veracity could not be stopped. A clash of wills ensued, a life and death struggle in the watery realm. In a gruesome display of violence, the predator's jaws clamped, enclosing Jose's left arm and head within its mouth. Its razor-sharp teeth tore through his flesh, tearing chunks of his upper torso and left arm away. In the midst of the struggle, the predator sank its teeth into Jose's inline accumulator tank, but it was unable to puncture it. The shark clamped down with more and more pressure until suddenly the tank gave in and exploded. His crew and the other fishermen watched from their boats as a gory mess of red bubbles began to ascend from the depths. At that chilling moment, they watched as the head of a colossal shark broke the water surface, revealing its presence a mere three meters from Jose's boat. The scene that unfolded before the horrified onlookers was nothing short of a nightmare. 
Dangling eerily from the beast's menacing jaws hung the remnants of Jose's decapitated upper torso, left arm, and shoulder, which were connected only by a fragment of his shredded wetsuit. In that grim moment, time seemed to stand still as the fishermen grappled with the shock and horror that enveloped them. The air grew heavy with an indescribable mix of disbelief, anguish, and primal fear. With a sense of urgency and determination, nearby boats swiftly converged upon the harrowing scene as the relentless shark continued its menacing dance, circling the lifeless body and periodically mouthing it as a grim display of dominance. The motormen aboard the approaching vessels, driven by a mix of instinct and courage, unleashed the roaring power of their motors in a desperate attempt to deter the predator. The group of revving engines echoed across the water, creating an act of defiance in the face of primal terror. Their efforts yielded partial success as the shark momentarily veered away, providing a narrow window for the crew aboard Jose's boat to recover the mangled body. They grappled with the weight of their fallen comrade, however, the shark's insatiable hunger could not be quelled. It seized an opportune moment and lunged once again, this time targeting the body's right arm in a desperate attempt to reclaim its prize. But it didn't stop there. The shark swam about 15 meters from the boat, and in a heart-stopping spectacle, surged forward and tried to ram the boat at high speeds, its head thrust out of the water with its menacing jaws agape. The boat quivered under the immense force, twisting it with a powerful force that turned it 90 degrees, a testament to the raw strength of the predator and its willingness to protect its kill. Desperate to evade the relentless predator, the boatman frantically ignited the motor, hoping to steer the vessel to safety. But once again, with astonishing force, the shark launched a series of violent thrusts, ramming the prow of the boat with its formidable head. The impact reverberated through the vessel, threatening to shatter the thin barrier between life of the crew and the abyss below. The crew on board held their breaths as their bodies trembled from the ordeal. The shark's snout was even with the prow of the boat, and its tail was seen to extend about a meter beyond the stern. Its width matched that of the boat, showing just how big it was. As the boat's engine purred to life, the boatman skillfully guided the vessel towards shallower waters in a last-ditch effort to outmaneuver their relentless pursuer. But glancing over their shoulders, the shark was still in hot pursuit. Fortunately, its relentless pursuit led it into treacherous, shallow depths. And there, in a moment of defeat, the predator's voracious journey came to an unexpected end as its massive form became grounded, its predatory prowess foiled by the changing tides. In a surge of collective relief, the crew seized the opportunity and their chance for survival and hastily abandoned their vessel before the shark could free itself. Just as the last crew member had safely made it out of the water onto land, the shark had thrashed its way back into deeper water and disappeared. An autopsy on Jose's body at the Los Vilos Hospital on January 9, 1980, showed decapitation at the seventh cervical vertebra, including amputation of the shoulder and left arm. The clavicle had been torn off, as was part of the scapula, and no shark tooth fragments were recovered. It was estimated that the great white shark responsible for the fatal attack on Jose Lorenis Miranda was more than seven meters long, which would make this shark one of the biggest recorded great whites in the world. His attack is a reminder that as much as the expanse oceans yield immeasurable treasures, they too yield perils in equal measure. Shark attacks like these are what truly give sharks such a feared reputation. A shark attack so brutal is hard to write off as an attack based on false identity. The shark knew what it was hunting and seemed to enjoy the taste. Sadly, for Jose Miranda, he was one of the few who came face to face with one of the most ferocious predators in the ocean, his final moments looking into the shark's jaws before meeting his terrifying final affliction. Most experts agree that great white shark attacks rarely occur. However, it's often a violent and gruesome scene when they do. After all, 
The great white shark is one of evolution's success stories. With seven rows of razor-sharp teeth and a powerful bite that can tear almost any sea creature in half, these creatures are one of the most formidable ocean predators. Once you enter their territory, it's essential to recognize the danger of being around such an incredible hunter. In one unfortunate instance, on July 17, 2000, a surfer by the name of Shannon Ainsley was in the middle of a session when not one but two great white sharks went after him, an event so rare that if it wasn't recorded on camera, it would be hard to believe. 15-year-old Shannon Ainsley just finished the first day of school after a nice long winter break, and like most days, he was ready to surf. At such a young age, Shannon became incredibly passionate about surfing. He only wanted to hit the waves and practice his newfound love. However, school would lessen his time in the ocean, making him all the more eager to go surfing that day. Two years ago, their father dropped Shannon and his older brother off at the Nahoon Beach in East London, South Africa. He remembered it was 7 a.m. and their dad only gave them bread, bananas, and a surfboard. With nothing else to do, Shannon decided to try his luck at this new and exciting activity. Upon hitting the waves, Shannon and his older brother immediately fell in love. They became almost addicted to surfing, riding the variety of excellent and powerful waves around the coast of East London. Now he was 15, and that was all he wanted to do. It was a warm winter's day on July 17th, and Shannon planned on surfing the waves of Nahoon Reef one of the area's most popular surfing and swimming spots. Upon arriving, Shannon grabbed his surfboard and went to the shores of the beach. He gazed at the churning waves in the distance and began to run through his mental checklist of prerequisites in surfing. Even though the reef was famous among surfers, Shannon didn't want to take a chance surfing in bad conditions. After all, it was also filled with sharks. He gazed at the slightly cloudy sky eyeing if enough sunlight was peering through the overcast. There were no birds around the area, nor was there a strong fishy smell in the air. All were good indicators. The waves were perfect on that warm winter's day, as they were just overhead high and there was very little wind. It seemed like a very good day to be out surfing. Shannon tested the waters a few feet away from the shore. It was warm, even for winter conditions. Today was just too perfect. Shannon couldn't resist the urge to surf. Heading into the waters, Shannon began paddling away further from the shore to meet the waves. He floated on the water's surface while waiting for the ideal timing. Eventually, the wind came in his favor. He pushed against his board, raising his torso up as the wave welcomed him. Meanwhile, his brother and their friends were doing the same thing a few yards away. Shannon took off. For a moment, he was carefree and unstoppable, unaware that a dangerous force was brewing beneath the surface. He continued riding the waves just like this over and over. After an hour and a half, something changed. Shannon's brother and their friends were riding waves. However, they suddenly caught the slightest whiff of sardines. This made them uneasy, prompting them to leave the water. After all, they believed the scent could attract sharks. While Shannon caught a whiff of the sardines himself, he didn't want to stop the surfing session. Instead, he stayed in the water with the rest of the surfers and waited for another wave. As he paddled along, Shannon caught another big wave. He was preparing to hit it, but suddenly something terrible happened. From his left, a large great white shark closed in and burst through the water colliding with Shannon's board. With speeds reaching 19 kilometers per hour, the shark's impact against Shannon's board was incredible. This immediately took him off balance from the board and sent him flying a few feet in the air. As Shannon flew into the air, he crashed into the wave and immediately met the marauding beast. The shark welcomed him with jaws wide open, biting his left hand and surfboard, then dragging him underwater. It wasn't until this point when Shannon realized that he was being attacked by a powerful predator. Thanks to the shock of the encounter, the shark's bite was numbed and Shannon couldn't feel anything. While the intrusive predator was dragging Shannon deeper underwater, 
another massive great white shark was sizing him up, waiting for the perfect opportunity. Speeding toward the commotion, the shark swiped for Shannon's head and shoulders. However, it missed because the other shark already had him by the hand. Unexpectedly, the second shark's presence must have done something to the first shark. The beast slowly loosened its grip on Shannon's hand after encountering the second great white shark. Shannon started to see things slow down. He thought he was in a dream. Unfortunately, the excruciating pain that was now kicking in bolted him back to reality. And just as he regained composure, Shannon found himself staring two feet away from a shark face to face. For a few seconds, the creature's beady eyes stared at Shannon as if it was in awe. Shannon could see the rows of teeth inside the creature's jaws. That was how close he was to the great white shark. Strangely, the creature didn't bother him. It swam away, brushing along his back and never appearing again. Regaining his composure, Shannon quickly swam to the surface and found his surfboard. A chunk of the board was missing. All it had was the bite mark of a large great white shark. Shannon climbed onto his surfboard, but then he was shocked to see that his right hand was barely hanging off from his forearm. His hand had puncture wounds, and he could see his wrist bone sticking out. Shannon was about 100 meters out at sea while bleeding, and all he could think about was getting back to shore. With the amount of blood in the water, his biggest fear was more sharks being attracted to the area to finish him off. Due to his injuries, the only way he could get back to shore was to wait for another wave. For the next 20 minutes, Shannon slowly paddled toward the shore, waiting for a wave that never came. He eventually made it to dry land and called for help. Soon, Shannon was rushed to the hospital, where he had to undergo a complicated surgery for his right hand. He almost lost two fingers, but eventually recovered fully. After the attack, Shannon rightfully developed a fear of sharks, causing him to stay away from surfing for a while. However, Shannon eventually found a way to overcome his fears. He started a surfing school in Jeffreys Bay and later relocated to Norway so he could teach the national surfing team. What happened to Shannon was quite frightening, but because he returned to surfing, it wasn't the last time he had to face the fearsome predator. In one instance, Shannon had to save a surfer from the jaws of another shark. According to him, it was much more frightening than his own attack, as he had more presence of mind and was more aware of what was happening. Today, Shannon is highly active on social media and has amassed a following. While Shannon considers himself very lucky, he hasn't stopped doing the thing he loves most, surfing. However, we must all remember that Shannon's case was very isolated and most shark attacks involving great whites end very badly, often in someone's horrifying final affliction. Swimming in the ocean has been popular throughout history for its proven physical, mental, and spiritual benefits. Seawater helps to relax your muscles, improves your mood, and cleanses your aura, leading to an all-around better quality of life. Although the pastime is popular across the generations, the older a person gets, then the more benefits they will receive from swimming in the sea. As a result, lots of elderly people will swim every day to improve their flexibility, especially if they live near the ocean. In most places of the world, there would be little risk associated with the hobby, aside from the occasional friendly fish encounter. But as most people know, the Australian waters are home to some of the world's most venomous fish, as well as the most dangerous sharks. Even if you know the area well, and you've visited the same beach thousands of times before, you never know when your luck will run out in Australian waters. 63-year-old Christine Armstrong was in a good mood, not that she was ever in a particularly bad mood. She had just returned home after her holiday in New Zealand, where she had been able to explore the country and relax. Although she had a good time, she always loved her day-to-day -day life and was happy to return and get back into her normal routine. Among other things, her favorite part of her day was her daily swim in the sea in Tathra. She lived very close to the ocean, something that she had carefully planned with her husband when they moved there 
as she was an avid swimmer and ocean enthusiast. She had been coming to the same spot every morning for the last 14 years, so she knew the area better than most. She preferred to swim alone, but was always happy when people wanted to come with her, especially her husband, Rob Armstrong. Rob had lived in Tathra for 60 years and had watched as the area had gradually become overrun with sharks. Although they used to be hunted by local fishermen, this practice had been banned in the 90s, leading to a population increase. He had always worried about his wife swimming there, but she had never reported seeing any sharks while she was out, so he thought that maybe he was overreacting. He would soon come to realize just how right he was in the worst way possible. On April 3, 2014, Christine and her husband went to their usual swimming area with a couple of friends, ready to swim the 250-meter circuit that they regularly swam. Chatting as they approached the beach, Christine was telling them all about her trip to New Zealand while they listened intently to her every word. She was happy to have such close friends, and as they began to swim out, she felt at peace now that she was back home again. After they got a little way out to sea, Christine changed her mind about the morning swim. Her body was aching from the flight the day before, so she decided to head back to shore instead, leaving her husband and her friends to complete the circuit alone. Telling everyone that she would meet them back on shore, she began to head back. They had already made it quite far out from shore, but she was confident that she would make it back without a problem. As she swam, she admired her surroundings and watched as her friends disappeared from sight. She was sad about not being able to complete her daily swim, but was sure that her body would feel better tomorrow. What she didn't know is that she was being stalked by a huge shark beneath her, which was watching her movements and readying itself for the attack. It had been attracted to the area by the smell of a rotting shark corpse nearby, but was more than happy to hunt for easy prey. Unfortunately, today would not be Christine's lucky day, and before she even knew what had happened to her, she was silently pulled beneath the waves by the massive shark as the animal swallowed her whole. The rest of the group had no idea what had happened and were still completing their circuits thinking that Christine would be waiting for them on the shore when they got back. Once they were finished, they started racing back to shore, but Rob had a bad feeling as they rounded the bay. Scanning the water, he suddenly spotted a large dark mound in the water and immediately identified it as a large bronze whaler shark. With birds circling, he knew that the shark had caught something and they would have to be careful not to attract its attention. He saw his friends heading straight for it as they clearly hadn't spotted it yet. He began shouting out to them to stop and turn around. He caught up to them before they swam straight into it and decided that the best way to avoid an attack would be to form a barrier together. They knew that if the shark were to attack, it would go for a singular victim. If they stuck together in a chain, the shark was less likely to attack. Luckily, this worked and they were able to escape unharmed. As they laughed with each other about what a close call that was, Rob realized that someone was missing, his wife. He was expecting her to greet them on the shore, but she was nowhere to be seen. He began to panic and started to ask people on the beach if they had seen her leave the water, to which they replied no. No one had come out of the water except them. They started to search the areas that she could have gone, as maybe the beachgoers had missed her when she left the sea. They checked the changing rooms and the car, but she wasn't there, so they decided to head back into the water to see if they could see her. They hoped that she had maybe continued swimming by herself in a different part of the ocean and just hadn't come in yet, or had left the water on a different beach. But as time passed, they began to realize that this was more and more unlikely. Afraid to swim into the water, after seeing the large whaler shark, they took a boat out and started their search. While calling out her name as they went along, they suddenly found clear evidence that they would never see Christine again. Human remains. There was not much left, but by the amount of blood that was staining the water, they knew that she must have died. Realizing the worst had happened, Rob called for the emergency services, stating that there had been a shark attack. 
They arrived quickly and began to scan the waters, where, among the blood and carnage, they were able to retrieve a swim cap and goggles belonging to Christine. Rob was devastated. It was never determined what species of shark was responsible for Christine's death. Although there was the large whaler shark seen by the swimmers, it was thought that a great white shark would be more likely due to the expected size of the animal. It was suspected that Christine was killed instantly, swallowed whole by the animal, something a whaler shark would have had a hard time doing. The authorities stated that they wouldn't search for the shark responsible and instead focused on educating people about the dangers of the beach. More and more illegal fishermen had been visiting the area in the last few years and would place bait to attract the animals. They began to increase their watch in the bay to ensure that this practice would stop in order to save more lives in the future. Although horrified by the death of his wife, Rob was relatively optimistic about the last moments of her life, stating that she must have been nearly instantly killed as the shark that he had spotted had been so large. He and others in the group that day estimate the shark they saw to be around six meters long, making it double the size of even the largest bronze whaler shark. With very little remaining of Christine, it was assumed that the animal must have swallowed her almost entirely, leaving nothing for her family to find besides her goggles and cap. Although Rob was depressed after Christine died and it was difficult for him, he continued living his life as much as he could. He still swims with the same group to this very day, despite the horrible memory of witnessing his wife's terrifying final affliction. Dave was a 66-year-old retiree. He had worked as a skilled veterinarian in California for most of his adult life. It was a job he loved, in a place he loved, the upmarket suburb of Solana Beach. The town is home to about 13,000 residents and situated just north of San Diego. Dave and his family had lived there since the 1970s. Dave had always been an active man. During his retirement, he enjoyed taking a swim in the beautiful coastal waters just a couple of blocks from his home. He was a member of a local triathlon training group. The club had been swimming in the same area for more than six years without incident, but that was about to change. Just before 7 a.m. on the 25th of April, 2008, Dave and the group of triathletes headed down to the Tide Beach Park for their regular swim. The beach has some of the best sand in Solana Beach. It is a popular spot for swimming and surfing. It also has tidal pools at low tide, perfect for spotting all manner of sea creatures in the shallows. A long staircase winds down the cliff from the street to the sand below. The group wore full-length black wetsuits and goggles. There was nothing unusual about the day. In fact, the skies were a brilliant bright blue. There wasn't a cloud to be seen. The sea was calm with a few waves rolling in. There were several surfers hoping for larger waves as the morning began. As the group entered the water and began swimming out from the shore, Dave was in the middle of the pack. They swam past the surfers who were floating on their boards the glassy water suggested perfect conditions for the swim. Unbeknown to the group, one of the surfers had spotted a stranded seal pup on the beach that morning. The surfer had thought nothing of it and left it alone. But was this a warning sign? Did this mean that a pod of seals had been swimming near the coastline that day? Could the seals have attracted sharks to the coastal waters, a top predator in search for its prey? The answer was yes. When Dave reached about 150 meters from shore, he was taken completely off guard. Below the group of swimmers, a 17-foot great white shark came in for an attack. It was on the hunt, drawn to the location and promise of food from the seals. Perhaps the group of swimmers looked like a pod of seals from below, or perhaps the shark could see the swimmers were easy prey. As it circled below, it locked its eyes on its target above it and began its attack. Thrashing its tail back and forth, it powered through the water, its body pointing upwards in the water column, making a beeline for the surface. Its best chance of securing its prey was the element of surprise, an ambush attack. 
As it closed the distance between itself and Dave, the 66-year-old was blissfully unaware of the danger he was in, of how fragile his life was, and how terrifying the next few seconds would be. He never saw the shark coming. It attacked from below and from behind him and hit him at tremendous speeds. The shark opened its jaws at the last second. As it made contact with Dave's legs, its eyes rolled back in their sockets. Dave was sent soaring into the air. The swimmers and surfers around him turned in shock as they heard the commotion and watched the wetsuit-clad figure who had flung into the air. The still quietness of the early morning ocean was shaken into a scene of horror. When Dave landed back in the water, he screamed, Shark! before he was dragged below. The shark had a tight grip on his legs, its terrifying serrated teeth holding him in a vice, pulling him downwards. He fought back. He tried to swim back to the surface, pulling with his arms. He could see the sunlight above him as he was dragged down. But then the shark let go. Dave burst towards the surface and gasped. Bravely, two of his friends who had been just 20 yards in front of him dashed back to his aid. They had seen the shark rise right up and out of the water with Dave in its jaws. They could see the water turn red as the shark's teeth sliced into Dave's legs. They had watched in horror as they saw their friend drag underwater. When he bobbed back to the surface with his arms flailing, the two swimmers grabbed hold of his upper body and swam him back to shore. They kicked furiously with their legs, unsure if the shark was coming back for more. They knew it could be directly below them, following the blood trail left by Dave. It was an agonizing swim back to the beach. It was frantic as they kicked with all their might, trying to get their friend to safety as quickly as possible. Rob Hill, who was also a member of the triathlon club, was running on the beach at the time of the attack. As he looked out to sea at his friend swimming just offshore, he saw Dave being violently lifted up and out of the water. Then he watched as two of them pulled Dave to shore. He could see the deep wounds on Dave's legs. He was limp and lifeless as the two swimmers pulled him onto the sand. There was little blood flowing from his wounds now. His heart had stopped beating. He was pale. Lifeguard Grant Fletcher rushed to the scene when a group of women screamed for help. He attempted to revive Dave. He drove him to the lifeguard station in the back of his truck. Both lifeguards and paramedics worked on Dave for more than 20 minutes, desperately trying to revive him. But it was too late. He was pronounced dead at 7.45 a.m. It's likely Dave bled out before he even made it back to shore. The back of his wetsuit was shredded from the waist down. Deep but clean gashes across his legs suggested a great white shark was responsible. Some of his fellow swimmers had reported seeing the gray skin of the shark as it arched up and out of the water. But amongst the heat of the moment, they were unable to identify it. The attack had been so sudden and so forceful that the injuries Dave had sustained were unsurvivable. The group, who had been swimming in the same spot for the past six years, had never seen a shark there before. Dave had been in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was a tragic death for the recently retired vet. He had worked his entire life and was now enjoying his time as a free man. His passion for fitness and the great outdoors were things he loved. Many paid tribute to an incredibly kind and friendly man. His eldest son spoke bravely of how, despite the tragic circumstances surrounding his father's death, it brought them some peace to know that he had died doing what he loved, in a place he loved, surrounded by friends. Following the attack that Friday morning, lifeguards closed the beaches and helicopters scoured the sea for any sign of the shark. The sea patrol called out through their megaphones from the helicopters for people to leave the water as there had been a fatal shark attack. Signs were put up to warn swimmers and surfers of the water, but as sharks are highly migratory, it is likely the shark moved on. Swimming in the vicinity the next day would not have been any more dangerous than swimming there any other day. Even if the great white shark had been spotted, then the authorities wouldn't have been able to do much about it anyway, as they are a protected species. It is difficult to manage marine wildlife in a way that makes swimming and other water activities safer. Some parts of the world, like South Africa's Durban coastline, 
have deployed shark nets to great effect, but these require management and maintenance. They are also responsible for a significant amount of bycatch, harmless animals caught up in the nets and drowned. In the end, if we enter the water, then we must acknowledge the dangers that come with it and the possibility of meeting your terrifying final affliction. In December 1957 and the months that followed, a series of devastating shark attacks plagued South Africa's east coast. A combination of factors enticed greater number of sharks to the area. There were whaling ships operating just offshore. Exceptionally high tides had flooded rivers, washing livestock from surrounding farmland into the water. Huge volumes of river water flowed into the sea, churning up the seabed, increasing turbidity and reducing underwater visibility. On top of those conditions, coastal resorts had developed in South Africa, drawing hundreds of visitors into the sea. It was a perfect storm. On Wednesday, 18th December 1957, 16-year-old Robert Worley headed down to the water on Durban's coast in South Africa. He arrived at the beach at Caradine, 37 kilometers south of the busy port of Durban, with his two friends, Tony Duffy and Brian Dobson. The boys were no stranger to the water. Robert was an amateur lifesaver at Isipingo, a beach a few miles north. They grabbed their bodyboards and joined the other surfers and bathers in the water. The conditions were perfect, the waves were a good size, the weather was warm, and the water was clear. They spent the morning riding the waves, enjoying the thrill of the surf. As morning came to an end, they swam out of the water and took a break, but the waves had been so good that they decided to head back in later in the afternoon. By now, the conditions had changed slightly. There was a change in the tide, and the water that flowed into the Pacific Ocean from the Misimbazi River mouth was turning the water cloudy. Even so, there were 50 or 60 bathers in the sea. Robert and Tony headed in once more. They paddled out past the swimmers, just beyond the breakers. He floated on his bodyboard, the furthest out from the beach. His legs dangled in the murky water. He looked out to sea, anticipating the waves as they grew and tumbled towards him. After 20 minutes, Robert felt something brush past his leg. He instinctively looked down and saw a large, dark shadow swim past him in the water. He didn't immediately think it was a shark. But when the shadow circled back around and came towards him, he knew he was in trouble. A moment later, as the shadow powered forwards, a dorsal fin sliced through the water just two feet from where he floated. Then he felt it, the terrifying sensation of something sharp and powerful grabbing him by the left leg. It tugged him so hard that he was ripped from his bodyboard and pulled underwater. Below the surface, he was fighting for his life. He kicked furiously and tried to hit the shark on the face. Air escaped from his lungs and a column of bubbles rose upwards. The shark shook him ferociously in its jaws. Its power was palpable. As Robert was thrashed from side to side, he could feel himself surge through the water as he was held tightly in the shark's lethal grip, being dragged down and further down. He looked up at the surface. Sunlight penetrated the water just feet above him. He cried out, but his screams were muted beneath the waves. Then, to his complete surprise, he was released, almost as quickly as he had been dragged underwater. He felt himself break free. He propelled himself upwards and broke through the surface, taking in gulps of air. He felt the warm air on his face as he anxiously looked around. Kicking at the water to stay afloat, Robert suddenly realized that he had lost his leg. The shark had severed it from the rest of his body. The release he felt earlier that allowed him to make a quick escape to the surface hadn't actually been the shark letting him go. It was his leg being ripped off that freed him. The shark crunched through his lower leg with such power that it severed his lower leg from his upper leg without Robert even noticing it was gone. Robert panicked at the surface and shouted to others who swam just yards away. At first, they thought that he was just messing around, but when his pleas became desperate, Leon Melherby, who was swimming close by, came to his rescue. 
Leon was on a camping holiday at the time and had decided to go for a swim that afternoon. As he rushed to the aid of the youngster, he was joined by another swimmer, who together pulled Robert to shore. It felt like an agonizingly slow swim to get to the safety of dry land. The shark could have been circling below them. The blood trail could have been enticing other sharks to the area. When they made it to shore, a qualified nurse rushed over to them and applied pressure to Robert's stump until emergency services arrived. Robert was rushed to the African Explosive Hospital in Umbagatwini, just 10 miles away. He remained conscious throughout the whole ordeal and was able to describe the attack in great detail. He had lost his leg below the knee. It had been bitten clean off by the shark, and now his thigh muscle was torn and shredded on his upper leg. Robert and the surgeons made the decision to amputate the upper leg as well, leaving him with just a short stump below his waist. Robert described being able to still feel his leg after he had lost it, a sensation known as the phantom limb syndrome. He could feel his toes itch, but couldn't relieve it because there were no toes to itch. He found these new sensations frustrating, but it was something that he was going to have to get used to as he adjusted to his new life without one leg. At first, Professor J. L. B. Smith identified the attacker as a ragged tooth shark, but this species doesn't have the strength needed to sever human bone. Only a shark having heavy serrated teeth could have inflicted the injury. It was later theorized that the most likely candidates for the attack are a tiger shark or a great white shark. Robert's attack was the first in a series of shark attacks that plagued the KwaZulu-Natal coastline in what became known as Black December. It was a terrifying time for visitors and locals alike, and tourists left in droves. Over the next four months, nine people were attacked by sharks along the same stretch of coastline. Six of them were fatal. The next attack to happen in the Natal waters took place just two days after Robert's attack and 60 miles south. Alan Green was 15 years old. He had emigrated to South Africa from the U.S. He had grown up with his mother in America and now moved in with his father on the African continent. They lived in Johannesburg together, but over the festive season decided to head to the Durban coast for a three-week holiday. On Friday, December 20th, 1957, Allen entered the water at Uvongo, where they were staying at the hotel. 80 miles away in Durban, lifesavers were battling with the sea conditions. The water was rough and they were patrolling a stretch of beaches swarming with 25,000 visitors. After rescuing nine people from drowning in the water, they closed the beaches for two hours until conditions improved. But further south at Uvango, the sea was comparatively calm. Around 50 swimmers were in the water. It was a sheltered bay, almost completely closed off to the open sea. Conditions were calm and underwater visibility was relatively good where the bathers were. Alan swam across a deep channel to a sandbank. There, he climbed out of the water and watched as the meter-high waves crashed at his feet. Looking out to sea, Alan saw something floating in the water. It was the carcass of a sheep bobbing up and down in the surf, washed down the river by recent floods. The ocean was awash with vegetation and debris. The water was murky and discolored, a stark contrast to the sheltered patch of water where the beachgoers were swimming. Alan jumped back into the water, where he and his friend John Digasilli splashed in the channel just 30 yards from the beach. As 20-year-old John caught a wave towards the shore, John's father suddenly spotted something that made him shout out to the two boys. Shark! he cried as a fin sliced through the water just yards from the youngsters. John turned his head and spotted the tail fin of the shark heading towards Alan, who now stood in just one meter of water. The shark's head raised up out of the ocean. Its jaws were agape and its serrated teeth on display. It latched onto Alan closing its enormous jaws around the 15-year-old's right arm and right side of his torso. Alan cried out as he felt the shark's powerful grip. The shark's teeth severed skin and muscle. Horrified onlookers watched as the shark pushed the boy along the surface of the water. Its tail thrashed wildly from side to side as it propelled itself and its victim through the shallow water on the far side of the channel. 
swimmers immediately rushed to Alan's aid. They linked arms, forming a human chain across the water channel. The water had turned red around Alan as the commotion unfolded. After a few terrifying seconds, the shark released its grip, and Alan was grabbed by the other beachgoers. But the damage had already been done. He was passed along the chain of swimmers, his limp body unresponsive, his eyes closed. When he was pulled to shore, the severity of the attack became apparent. The shark had bitten into his arm and tore gaping holes from his abdomen and chest. Tragically, the youngster had died from blood loss before he even made it to the beach. There were dozens of witnesses for this brutal attack on Alan, but the species of shark is still unknown and was never verified. It's thought to be the work of a tiger shark, who is known to move into shallow water to hunt, especially around sandbars where Alan was attacked. With two people attacked by a shark within days of each other, and one of those attacks being fatal, the local beachgoers and tourists alike were beginning to think a man-eating shark was lurking in the area. Little did they know, Alan wouldn't be the last fatality in the area. Seven more swimmers would be attacked in the coming months, and what would become one of the deadliest shark attack sprees in history. Alan was just the first unlucky swimmer to meet his terrifying final affliction.